Hello, my name is Ben Forster. I'm a nephrology fellow here in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I'm gonna to speak to you guys today about acute kidney injuries in the hospitalized patient. Um, why do we wanna talk about this? Well, for anybody who hasn't um, practiced any inpatient medicine in a while, um, give us a good refresher. And anybody who's just learning um, about hospital medicine, I'll give them some good basics. This isn't an inclusive talk, this is just the basics, um, just to get the nitty gritty down as far as how we handle this in the inpatient setting. I'm gonna go through diagnostic criteria, um, the different types of acute kidney injuries, how to evaluate them, how to diagnose them, and then ultimately how to treat them. Um, why is an acute kidney injury an important diagnosis to have? Well, in the hospitalized setting, patients who develop these end up having a higher morbidity and mortality. Um, they also have a higher incidence of achieving or getting chronic kidney disease later on in their life after having an episode of acute kidney injury. Anywhere from about 20 to 25% of patients will develop a chronic or an acute kidney injury during a hospital stay, um, and that's much higher in the ICU setting. Somewhere around 60 to 65% of patients will develop one. Um, so first off, how do we determine if a patient has an acute kidney injury? So we have three different societies um, that all have different guidelines. Um, between those guidelines, three things are pretty um, standard between all of them. We have an increase in the serum creatinine of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter above their baseline creatinine. Um, and that's over a period of 48 hours that we would see that. Um, we also have an increase in serum creatinine greater than 1.5 times their baseline creatinine. And that's going to be over a week or seven days. Um, and we can also put the creatinine aside and look at urine, see how much urine they're producing. If they're making less than 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour um, over the course of six hours, they would also classify as an acute kidney injury. For reference, in a patient who's 70 kilograms, um, that would be 35 cc's or less um, per hour. So typically in the ICU setting, we get a little bit cautious when somebody's urine output drops below 30 or 35 cc's per hour. Um, that is going to be something determined on their weight. Obviously, somebody who's heavier um, is going to have higher thresholds. Somebody who's lighter is going to have lower thresholds. But one of the standards we typically use is around 30 to 35 cc's. Um, so after we have diagnosed or somebody has met those diagnostic criteria, um, what we would want to do is determine what type of acute kidney injury do they have. Um, we have three different types. We have pre-renal, intrinsic and post-renal. Um, the easiest would be the post-renal, so I'll go ahead and describe that one first. So post-renal is gonna be an obstruction. Um, your urine coming from your kidneys is not able to flow, flow freely outside the body. It's getting backed up somewhere. So we have a schematic right here. Um, this is aorta and then your renal arteries, blood flowing to the kidneys, kidneys, and then we have our ureters, which are draining urine down into the bladder. So in these post-renal or obstructive cases, the kidneys are making urine, no issue, but somewhere along these ureters, this bladder, there's some kind of obstruction that the urine can't pass through. Um, what we can typically see in these cases would be bladder outlet, bladder outlet obstruction, which we can see in elderly men with prostate issues, either BPH, prostate cancer, they have enlargement, um, that it's squeezing on their urethra. Um, and their bladder is filling up with urine, ultimately backtracking into the kidneys, causing some hydronephrosis. Um, we can also see issues with clots that are made in the bladder. Anybody who's having gross hematuria, they're prone to forming clots, and that can cause the same thing. Um, urine's not able to freely pass through. Um, we could have, in our female patients, we could have uterine um, or other gynecologic masses, or in any male or female patients, any kind of abdominal mass that would be compressing on bilateral ureters, which could be causing issues as well. Stones, typically they're unilateral. Um, so let's say we have a stone right up here. Um, that stone is blocking urine going through here, causing this kidney to um, cause hydro have hydronephrosis. Not producing, or not able to, the urine's not able to flow through. However, we have this contralateral kidney that is working just fine and the urine's flowing. So this may go unnoticed for a while until the patient develops symptoms of a kidney stone or pressure from the kidney pain. Um, again, with this one, it could be from prostate, anything compressing on the ureters, 
um, less likely stones, unless the patient has a solitary kidney. Um, this accounts for about 10% of patients with a hospitalized AKI. Pre-renal AKIs, um, this is due to inadequate flow um, of blood or perfusion pressure to the per perfusion pressure to the kidneys themselves. So we have this aorta that's supplying blood to our renal arteries. Um, anything that impacts that flow is going to cause pre-renal issues. The kidneys like a set amount of volume, a set amount of pressure delivered to them. Anytime that that is um, decreased, the kidneys become unhappy and aren't able to function as well as they should. So certain things can cause this. The most easy or the most common that we see as far as the pre-renal um, ones would be hypovolemia. So the patient could come in dehydrated, they've had a lot of insensible losses, they have had poor oral intake, they've had vomiting, diarrhea, um, all of those things cause the patient to be dehydrated or have a low volume status. Um, with that low volume status, the blood flow to the kidneys is gonna be decreased. Um, that counts for about one in five AKIs in the hospital setting. Other things that could cause this, um, hepatorenal syndrome or cardiorenal syndrome. While in these patients, we typically see the patient being fluid overloaded. They have excess edema, maybe some fluid in their lungs, some ascites. Um, their intravascular volume or their arterial volume is actually depleted uh, because of all that fluid has third spaced. Because of that, that in, the low arterial volume isn't able to perfuse the kidneys as well. Um, so they have all this fluid, but it's not used as, or is not being utilized as it um, could be. Um, also causing pre-renal states could be high levels of calcium. Um, calcium, whether it's ingested at high loads, there's a malignancy causing the high calcium level, sarcoidosis, um, they are all gonna cause uh, you to lose free water through your urine. Um, and that's gonna lead to a dehydrated state. Um, other things that are gonna cause pre-renal would be abdominal compartment syndrome. We see this in acute abdomen patients. Um, this is gonna cause compression, not only on the kidneys and the other abdominal organs, but also on the vasculature. Um, so these renal arteries are not gonna be able to deliver um, blood as well as they could. Our last type of AKI would be the intrinsic. Um, with them, there's a whole lot of different things going on. So we'll break it down into a couple different compartments. Um, and there's typically something pathological going on in one of those compartments that's causing the injury. So we have the tubules, the interstitium, the glomeruli, and the vasculature. In the tubules, um, if there's an injury there, which is again, the most common type of injury that we see, acute tubular necrosis, that accounts for almost 50% of acute kidney injuries within the hospital. How do we develop acute tubular necrosis? A handful of different ways. Um, so patients who are septic, are in shock, people who have low blood pressures for a long or for a prolonged amount of time, people who have a pre-renal state for a prolonged amount of time, they're all prone to developing acute tubular necrosis. Um, other things that we do to the patients, so drugs, specifically vancomycin, can cause ATN. Um, contrast can cause ATN um, along the lines of a contrast induced, ne induced nephropathy. Um, other things, either the elderly patient had a fall, the young patient who overexerted himself, they're prone to developing rhabdo. That muscle breakdown and release of myoglobin is directly toxic to the tubules. Um, and then in other scenarios, we have patients who, let's say they just started a new chemo chemotherapeutic agent, um, and they're prone to tumor lysis syndrome. Tumor lysis syndrome is going to cause a lot of cellular breakdown, and that, again, is going to be toxic to the kidneys. Um, Within the interstitium, um, we can have acute interstitial nephritis. Um, this is a very um, less likely thing that we encounter. It's about 2% of the patients who develop an AKI. And this is mostly due to drugs. Most of the common, most of the common offending agents are gonna be your penicillins, cephalosporins, PPIs, sulfa drugs to include diuretics like the loop diuretics. Um, glomeruli. Um, how the glomeruli gets affected and what we'd be concerned about most would be something like an RPGN, a rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis, or just a regular glomerular nephritis as well that's caught later on. We could be seeing some acute kidney injury to that as well. 
And then within the vasculature within the kidneys, we can see PTP, HUS, malignant hypertension, and even sclerodermal renal crisis. All these different causes of these um, different causes of vascular AKIs. So now that we have all these different types of AKIs, we want to try and distinguish what our patient has. Um, big things that we're going to have to go through. Um, and where we're going to get a majority of the information is going to be through the history and physical. Um, like most people, um, finding a diagnosis is about 80% H&P. Um, same thing with the kidneys. Um, good look at their history. You know, does the patient have heart failure? Do they have liver failure, cirrhosis? Do they have BPH? Do they have any kind of abdominal masses? Any recent surgeries? Um, if the patient's on stage five of their inpatient stay, it's gonna be extremely important to go back and look through everything that's been done this hospitalization, every medication they've gotten, um, what their vital signs have been. Did the patient have a, a blood pressure of 70 over 40 at one point, um, which would have predisposed them to developing ATN? Did they get a dose of Tordal in the emergency room? And now we're starting to see um, beginning features of an AIN or even an ATN. Um, did the patient get a, any radiological studies that had contrast? Um, CTPAs, left heart casts for um, cardiac reasons are a lot of ones that we normally run into. Um, after we get all that information uh, to include a physical exam, the physical exam is going to be very pertinent as far as determining the patient's volume status. The volume status is going to be a big part of treatment. So does the patient look like they're very puffy, they have a lot of edema, they have fluid on their chest x-ray, they have ascites, or does the patient look like they're very dry, reduced skin, or have very low skin turgor? Um, uh, all gonna help in diagnosis. Um, other things that are gonna help us are gonna be the lab work. Um, so on our basic BMP, things that we're gonna see, um, just by um, definition alone, we're gonna see an increase in the creatinine. With the increase in creatinine, we're gonna see the BUN go up as well. Potassium typically goes up in acute kidney injuries. Bicarb can go either way. If the patient is severely volume contracted, we might typically see a higher CO2 or an alkalosis as compared to normal. As where if the patient has um, severe, severe renal insufficiency, um, ATN, AIN, or tubular abnormalities, we're more likely to see an acidosis or a low bicarb. Um, calcium, again, high calciums may cause um, a diuresis. However, when we see things like rhabdo, tumor lysis syndrome, with all that cellular breakdown, um, even with kidney failure, we're more often than not going to see a low calcium level. Other things we're going to want to look at are going to be your complete blood counts, um, albumin, and your creatinine kinase. They're all going to round out the um, evaluation for um, ruling in different kind of GN diseases. Um, it may not be very pertinent when you're looking for pre-renal stuff, but we want to rule out the bad stuff. We'd like to have all these extra labs. Um, after getting all that serum stuff, um, the next big thing, us as nephrologists, we love looking at the urine. Um, so a UA with microscopy. Um, sending it down to lab can give you a lot of information. Um, so on the urinalysis, the dipstick alone, we can get a specific gravity. That specific gravity can tell us, is this patient dehydrated? If we see a specific gravity of 10, 20 or higher, chances are that they're likely um, going to respond to some fluid resuscitation. Also on that UA, you're going to have dipstick for a couple different things. You're going to have your hemoglobin, um, which if blood is present, um, sometimes if blood is absent, that hemoglobin will be positive that hemoglobin becomes positive by other things um, such as myoglobin. So if you have a patient with rhabdo, you might have a three plus hemoglobin on dipstick, but zero RBCs on microscopy. Other things to look for on dipstick are gonna be leukesterase and nitrite. So your leukesterase is gonna be positive if there's white blood cells. Um, those white blood cells come, can come from a variety of things, specifically an infection, um, urinary tract infection or pylo, or from AIN, if the patient has a lot of inflammation, they're also gonna have white blood cells in their urine. The nitrite um, is more of a specific marker for infection. So if the nitrite's positive, there's a high likelihood that the patient has some kind of gram-negative bug in their urine. Um, so if both leukesterase and nitrite are positive, chances are there's an infection. 
If Luke Esterase is positive and nitrite is negative, that doesn't really tell us all that much as far as an infection. Other things, um, microscopy. You may not get this with the lab microscopy. A lot of times we typically just see them remark on hyaline casts. Um, however, hyaline casts do fall into the pre-renal state. Um, if you get nephrology involved or if you spin the urine down yourself, other casts that you might notice would be white blood cell casts, which could be pyelonephritis or acute interstitial nephritis. If we see red blood cell casts, then we're in a lot of trouble. We're looking at these RPGNs or different kind of GNs. Um, other things on um, urine microscopy, if we have dysmorphic, red blood cells also going to fall under this glomerular disorders. Um, other stuff with urine, urine culture, if it's appropriate, urine electrolytes. Urine electrolytes can help you calculate a fractional excretion of sodium or urea. Those values can help us determine is this pre-renal or intrinsic. They're not always um, spot on, so we use them with caution when we're interpreting those numbers. Um, and then protein in the urine. We always wanna quantify how much protein in the urine. Um, we like to look at it in two different ways. We like to look at the amount of protein to creatinine as a spot ratio, and we also like to look at the microalbumin as well. Um, these are, um, in your initial workup, these are fine to be just spot collections. They don't have to be a full 24 hour. And then to round out the evaluation, we're going to get some radiology. We wanna get the, an ultrasound of the kidney and bladder. Um, that's gonna tell us a couple different things. Um, the biggest thing it does is rules out obstruction because um, it's gonna make sure that the bladder is empty and completely, or if it's not, it'll try and help us delineate where in the urinary system this obstruction is. It's also gonna give us sizes of the kidneys. It'll help us evaluate, does it look like maybe there's been evidence of chronic kidney disease if the patient has smaller kidneys or if the patient has larger kidneys, sometimes it gives us um, some value as determining what the diagnosis might be. So after we get all, these, all this information, we kind of piece it together and see where exactly um, where they fall. It's not always gonna be as easy as it looks on paper. A lot of times patients will have overlapping stuff. And a lot of times where we see that is this pre-renal state that evolves into ATN. Um, so there is a little bit of a spectrum there. Um, once we do think that we have a diagnosis, we're gonna go into treatment. Um, treatment is gonna be based on what the underlying issue is. Again, all of these have completely different underlying issues. Uh, so just to breeze through them real quick, what we would do in each case. So hypovolemia, you're gonna replace the fluid. Cardiorenal or hepatorenal, you're gonna diurese them until they're uvolemic. Hypercalcemia, you're gonna normalize their calcium. Abdominal compartment syndrome, you're gonna relieve the pressure. ATN, a lot of that is supportive. There's not much we can do um, other than making sure blood pressures are appropriate. Um, we remove all offending agents. We don't predispose them to any further insults. Acute interstitial nephritis, again, with that one, remove the offending agent. Um, sometimes we may, depending on how severe it is, may institute steroids. Glomeruli, if the glomeruli are involved, then you have some kind of glomerular nephritis. Um, typically, nephrology is gonna be involved at this point and treatment's gonna be dictated on which specific GN that is. Um, same with the vasculature. You'll probably have assistance with nephrology and maybe even hematology at that point. Post-renal, easy enough, just remove the obstruction, whether that's inserting a Foley, getting urology or interventional radiology on board and placing um, nephrostomy tubes to help the patient urinate. Other things to think about when you're treating um, is correct dosing of medications. So let's say we have a patient who on day three of their hospital stay has a GFR of 60. And then the next day they have a GFR of 40. We don't want to dose medications on that day as a GFR of 40. We actually want to reduce it much lower than that because um, we don't know what their trajectory is, but based on those two days of data, it's likely that the GFR is going to be lower the next day. On the opposite of that, um, if you have a patient who's recovering from an acute kidney injury, where day three their GFR is 20 and the next day their GFR is 35, we would actually dose their antibiotics a little bit higher than 35, probably around 45 or 50, knowing that that's the way that their kidney function is 
moving. We like to base GF or we like to base off GFR when GFR is in steady state. Um, other things to consider when to get nephrology involved. So you may encounter a patient that you're very uncomfortable with, you just don't understand what's going on, um, or you just have a question that you can't figure out based on this. Um, anytime that happens, you're concerned, by all means, get nephrology involved. Anytime you're concerned about a GN or an RPGN, get nephrology involved. Um, patients who develop severe AKI or renal failure, um, and you're concerned that they might need dialysis, um, either urgently, emergently, or in the next few days, um, it would be prudent to get nephrology involved. Um, based on lab work and other findings, um, some of the big things where you might encounter the patient immediately and think, hey, this guy needs dialysis right now. Some of those things to think about would be um, what I remember is the vowels, A, E, I, O, and U. Um, a being if the patient has an acidosis. So if the pH is less than 7.1 and we don't have a reason, a good reason for that, and it's not rapidly or be um, able to be corrected in a timely fashion, dialysis might be indicated for that. E for electrolytes. So mostly it's gonna be your potassium that's gonna be the hardest one to control. Um, potassium levels that aren't able to be controlled by medical management alone. Um, could be um, dialysis candidates. Eye ingestions, so not only toxic ingestions like methanol and ethylene glycol, but also some medications. Um, if a patient overdoses on them, they can be dialyzed off. Um, not all medications, some of them can. Um, o for overload, so a patient who is fluid overloaded and no longer responding to diuretics or doesn't have any urine output, um, they would be somebody that we would dialyze for volume. U, uremia. Um, so if the patient's BUN gets high enough, it can cause an altered mental status um, or even a pericardial effusion. Uh, both of those would be emergent indications for dialysis. Um, I hope this review on acute kidney injuries is helpful. Um, and I hope if you run into inpatient medicine um, that you can refer to this for any questions and always know that nephrology will be there to assist you.